So here's lecture four, so just two more lectures to go. This is all about design and construction of food premises and kitchens and food pests and control. So the aim of uh, this unit is to introduce you to the construction of food premises and kitchens and pest control and the learning outcomes, the sort of things you might well have questions on. By the end of this unit, you will be able to demonstrate an appreciation of the standards required in a hygienic kitchen working environment state the three properties required of an internal structure and recognize the signs of pest infestation and know what action to take. So with the design of food premises, they must be designed, constructed and equipped to minimize the risk of contamination. So with the ceilings, the walls, the doors, windows and floors, Flows rather, they must be constructed of materials that have three particular properties. And they are, they must be impervious, uh, that means uh, doesn't absorb any moisture. So finishes such as plastic or metal, um, but not softwood for example, they're classed as impervious materials. They only got easily cleanable, in other words just wipe over. Uh, there shouldn't be any cracks or crevices or difficult corners and it should be smooth as well as impervious. And durable or long lasting, um, up to the job, it's not going to break or splinter or fall into bits uh, when used for a period of time. Let's have a look at the storage and disposal of waste. Now bins and waste are reservoirs of contamination. Uh, you've got two types of bins that we use in kitchens. The first one is an internal bin. And you can see there that uh, the yellow is just the structure, the framework if you like. You can see the pedal underneath so it's foot operated. On the left of that you can see where the bin bag has been attached to the top and it's hanging or it's resting on this shelf there. Um, you shouldn't need to touch and don't uh, open the bins with your hands, just open it with your feet. Now they've got certain properties, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there shouldn't be any accumulations outside the main bin, so everything goes into the bin liner, must be cleanable, preferably disinfectable, and that's this structure here, and lastly emptied frequently throughout the day. Now this is another likely question uh, that might come up, when do you empty uh, bins uh, into the containers? frequently throughout the day. You don't leave it to the end of the shift, you don't wait till it's overflowing, even if it's half empty but it's quite heavy and you know any more in there could pull it from its frame, just take it out and throw it into the outside bin. And with the outside bins, they have certain properties also. No accumulations like is shown on this uh, diagram where you've got boxes left outside and food material because that will attract pests. It must be held on impervious base. So where the uh, feet or the wheels are, this base here should be made of something like concrete, tarmac, patio tiles, etc. But certainly not on soil or grass because that's where pests tend to hide. Pests don't like open spaces, they, they need to have somewhere to hide. And cleanable, preferably disinfectable, uh, throughout the summer for example, the inside can be disinfected once a week uh, with uh, power wash, uh, during the winter perhaps once every month. Tight fitted lids so pests can't gain access. And again, emptied regularly uh, by your local council or with the contractor that you've got an agreement with. Dates and storage. Uh, dates always come up. Uh, we've got two main dates that are in use in UK food safety legislation. The first is used by, the second one is best before. Used by is um, a legislative date in as much as if you uh, break the law regarding used by, you can be prosecuted. Now used by is a food safety date and that's used on perishable goods. Goods, foods that's got a potential to uh, harbour food poison bacteria, uh, have got a potential to cause food poisoning. So if you've got a use by date, say for example the 1st of November, if it's still on your shelves on the 2nd of November, you can get prosecuted. Now this is different to the best before date, which is not a legal requirement. Uh, in other words, if you've got anything on your, on your shelves, 
when an EHP uh, comes and visits and you've got foods past the best before date, uh, you will just be told off, basically. You'll go on a report. Um, but what you should do uh, with best before dates in industry is ad abide by the dates because it shows professionalism. Uh, if you leave things on your shelf past the best before date, again, when the EHP calls, uh, it's going to go into a report that you're not showing professionalism. But on the other hand, uh, I would ignore the best before dates at home. We f throw away far too many foods these days when it's past this best before date. You no need to. You can use dried rice, for example, 10 years after it's best before date. As long as it's in good condition, it's still dry, um, the taste is not going to be that good, uh, but still you can use it. Now, best before is a food quality date. So, use by is a food safety date. Best before is a food quality date. Uh, the best before date is a date that's recommended by manufacturers uh, to use the product by that date. Or after that, the flavour, the taste, the quality is not going to be as good. But certainly at home, ignore the best before date. Always go by the use by date at home, by the way, because um, it can uh, cause food poisoning at home as well as um, in work if you don't or if you ignore the use by date. And the last one there, FIFO, touched on that already, is first in, first out. It's a great method of stock control to th stop things going out of date. And now we're going to look at pests. Uh, we've got several different pests on there. We've got rodents, rats and mice, flies, cockroaches, uh, another fly over there, so there's a swarm of them. Uh, we've got birds, and we've got domestic pets. Domestic pets are not classed as food pests, but they must be kept out of the kitchen or anywhere near a food premises because uh, they've got uh, plenty of infection on their coats. Uh, just think of the way they clean themselves. You know, they're licking their ass and they're licking their coat and all that uh, fecal contamination is in their coat. Um, a cat tends to be uh, more infectious than a dog, by the way, but both need to be kept away from the food premises. So all these pests will contain food poisoning bacteria. Birds, for example, uh, will have uh, contamination in their feathers, in their beaks, uh, in their feces or drop-ins. Uh, rodents, again, uh, on their fur, in their urine, in their drop-ins, uh, in their mouth. Flies, they will have 120 different types of pathogens in their guts. Um, and so if they um, defecate, excuse me, on the food, um, they can poison it quite substantially. Cockroaches, they have a lot of infection on their shell, uh, or skin if you like. And also on their feet, so if they're running over food services, they will contaminate as they go. Now, pests thrive if they can find food, moisture, warmth and shelter. Um, in other words, uh, or also undisturbed areas. So again, a question that could possibly come up is where will you find pests? It's in undisturbed areas. Places like behind fridges, behind freezers, which are rarely moved for cleaning. Uh, behind sinks, where usually if they're fixed um, to uh, pipes, uh, they are never moved. But certainly these are the places you should be looking for. Um, in storage rooms, for example, look behind the shelves. Look uh, on the floor behind the shelves. Use a torch if you have to, because this is where you'll find uh, signs of pests. Which again, as a food handler, it's your responsibility. You must be checking for, pen, uh, for pests on a regular basis, um, at least once a week. And you should put them that into a diary to say you've checked, you haven't found any signs of pests. You say where you've checked as well. So evidence of pests. Again, this is a question uh, that comes up quite often. How do you know pests are there? Well, with most of them, uh, the, the signs of them are very similar. You'll find live or dead bodies. It's very same for insects, rodents and birds. You'll find damage. Uh, insects can damage rodents and birds. Drop-ins for insects, rodents and birds. Uh, something that's, that might be different, they'll say, how do you know if you've got a rodent uh, or evidence of rodent pests? 
Well, it could be smears and fur. Uh, a rat, for example, could brush up against a wall uh, near the floor, near the skirting board. Um, and that smear is because it's, it's got a high fat content uh, in its fur, but that smudge also contains infection. But it, it is a sign that you've got problems. You might see rat runs where you see where they've been running. Uh, birds, uh, feathers, uh, nesting material, perhaps uh, shells from eggs. Um, with insects, eggs or larvae um, could be another uh, indication. So, you know, the ones that are different, we've got eggs and larvae for insects. We've got smears and fur, rat runs for rodents. Then you've got feathers, nesting material and uh, eggshells as a method there for recognizing bird infestation. And why do we need to control them? Well, they cause disease, including food poisoning. They cause contamination, and anything that's contaminated needs to be thrown out. So there's a lot of wastage, therefore. Uh, they cause damage, damage to buildings, damage to pipes, to electrical systems, especially rodents, rats, for example, can uh, bite through uh, solid concrete, uh, through uh, pipe work, so you could have floods, and through electrical cables. You'll have lost custom, because if you are known for having a pest infestation, you won't get any customers coming along. You'll have complaints, staff losses, because at the end of the day, if the customer's not coming, you're not getting the business, bottom line means you'll have to lose staff. And it's the law, at the end of the day, um, you must not have any pests on the premises and you must take every precaution necessary to ensure you do not have pest infestation. So how can you prevent access? How do we stop them getting in the first place? Well, we can keep doors closed, stop any uh, rodents, any large animals like cats or dogs in, uh, but also check around the framework of the door and on the bottom to make sure there's no gaps there uh, which could uh, let rodents squeeze in or insects through. Similarly look for any damage around windows, not just the obvious broken window but look around the framework, make sure there's no holes or gaps. Check around any plumbing, again no holes or gaps and any damage to skirting boards at floor level. All these can give ingress to uh, pests which then will cause a problem. How do we get rid of them if you have got a problem? Well, we can use physical methods, which is the preferred option. And these can include ultraviolet electronic fly killers, uh, traps, could be sticky board traps, could be uh, spring traps, sticky fly papers, mist netting, which are nets which uh, you'll get in food factories put over uh, windows and doors, for example, to prevent birds from coming in. Uh, sticky fly papers, obviously you need to put those um, somewhere where they're away from food preparation. So you don't want the particles of the fly falling onto food. Then you've got the less preferred option, which is chemical methods, uh, using rodenticides for rodents and using insecticides for insects. Uh, several reasons why we shouldn't be using chemicals. First of all, if you're not qualified, you could end up poisoning your customers if you don't know how to use the chemicals. Um, if you use different types of rodenticides, you could end up uh, with a rat uh, that gives birth to the young, uh, which are immune to that rodenticide. Because you fed that uh, chronic acting poison to the rat, um, and what it does then, that goes into a system, and if it takes about seven or more days to die and it's pregnant and it's about to give birth, by what we call DNA transference, the part of that chemical can go into the young, into the young's DNA. So they will be immune to that uh, chemical. And lastly, four things to do when pests are on the premises, or you've recognised signs of pests. The first thing above all, you, what you must do is to inform your manager or line supervisor. You must dispose of the contaminated food. You must protect any other food that's not been contaminated and uh, with pest-proof containers, etc. And lastly, contact pest control. The experts, uh, they will sort out the problem for you. 
So that's uh, unit four uh, done and dusted. Uh, we've got revision tests uh, just underneath. So click on the link. Uh, this is the last revision test where we do unit five. There's no revision test after that. Uh, you can go straight to the exam. So again, it's not part of the exam, but uh, there's 10 questions here. It is worthwhile completing them just to see if you've remembered what I've just gone through. Uh, again, you can take it several times if you want to. Um, so you'll know which are the right answers. It will then um, ask you to send an email to me um, to give me a score in the revision test. But um, like you said, don't worry, it's not part of the exam. The exam is uh, a separate uh, test. So good luck with the revision test for Unit 4.